Well, there's a saying in the commodity business, and it should be in all businesses, that the cure for high prices is high prices. prices. Because <laughs> high prices cut demand and bring in supply. And that's what happened. Uh, the other part of the saying is the cure for low prices is low prices. If prices are low a long time, people buy more and stop producing. So, I mean, these cycles have been going on for hundreds of years, certainly, and probably thousands. And that's going to continue. Right. Prices have been going up. We had a high price of oil and the declining reserves of oil. Reserves of oil, known reserves, were declining everywhere, still are. New technology came along. And for a while, if you could spell fracking, people would give you money. <laughs> And a bubble developed. Then, of course, we all realized, oh, wait, we got to make money. These guys got to pay their debts. Right. So the fracking bubble popped and burst, as all bubbles do. Fracking's still there, but you got to make money at it now. So known reserves of oil still continue to decline, except for fracking. And fracking's not a bubble anymore. If we're speaking specifically about commodities, um, we had a big boom. Oil went from nothing to 150 U.S. dollars a barrel. Uh, it's now back to 60 U.S. dollars a barrel or whatever it is. Now we had booms, and that's happened with many, many commodities since then. You know, many commodities boomed and collapsed. As I look around, Jeff, bonds are in a bubble all over the world, as we've discussed. Property in many places uh, sold. I mean, I can't believe what a bubble there is in property and soul. Uh, many stocks are beginning to form bubble. I mean, not all stocks. I mean, there are many stocks that are still not up. But I can see Tencent, Amazon, Samsung. I mean, some of these stocks never go down. I've seen bubbles before. I know you have too or read about them. So I can see. Bu but commodities, that's the only asset class I see that's still cheap. Silver's down 45% from its all-time high. Sugar's down, I don't know, 70 or 80% from its all-time high. Oil's down over 50% from its all-time high. So commodity is the only asset class as a class that I see that's still cheap. And I know the fundamentals are changing. You know, more people in America study public relations and study agriculture now. Obviously, if the world changes, you have to, re you have to change with the world. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Energy is still the most important commodity, uh, at least if you ask me. As I go, I live in Singapore, and everybody here is still driving and taking the bus to work, et cetera, still has electricity. And nearly all energy comes from oil and natural gas. That may be changing. It seems to be changing. But, you know, Jeff, even if you look at things like electric cars, which seem to be coming, first of all, you've got to produce the electricity, which got to be made from something. Maybe it's sun power, maybe it's solar power or wind power. But electric cars, for instance, use five times as much copper as regular cars. So, yeah, the demand for oil may go down, but the demand for copper is going to go up and lead and lithium and other things. Throughout history, uh, if you print a lot of money, ultimately led to a debasement of your currency. What for me seems to be obvious reasons. And when currencies go down, something has to go up against it. And usually real assets go up against the currencies. And so I would suspect that we're going to have the price of real goods going higher. We always have anyway. But again, you have to consider the supply and demand aspects of it as well. But if you have a lot of money printing, the value of the money is going to go down and the value of something is going to go up against it, whether it's sugar or, you know, who knows what, lead, something. You know, you know even now China has debt. In 2008, China had a lot of money saved for a rainy day. It started raining. They started spending the money and helped save the world. Now even China has them. They're going to be bankruptcies in China. It's going to shock. It's going to shock me. And I just told you it's coming. It's already <laughs> happening. It's already happening. So the next bear market is going to be a nightmare. Is that some kind of huge observation, or is that just simple looking out the window? To me, it's looking out the window. A simple statement. The United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Doesn't matter who stops buying our treasuries. We've got a problem. We have a problem even if people continue to buy our trouble. I mean, it's not, it's a good time to be old because the old yeah. people are getting the benefits of all of them. It's not a good time to be young. 
I got two teenage children. Oh, the problems they're going to inherit. It's not a good time to be young. It's a good time to be old. Uh, you know, everybody is doing the same thing now. Everybody is printing money as fast as they can. Not everybody. I should retract that. Nobody is printing money as fast as the U.S. and the Japanese, for instance. In China, they still have interest rates, not great interest rates, but they're still proper interest rates. Whereas in Japan and America, there are no interest rates anymore. And in some in Germany. Uh, so some countries have done a better, less bad job than others. I am looking because I know enough history to know that somebody is going to come out of this in better shape compared to others who are going to come out in worse shape. The key, of course, is to find out all right who. And I don't have an answer yet. I do know China is doing a less bad job than Japan, for instance. But I own Japanese shares because they're you know they're printing money every day and buying ETFs. The Bank of Japan has more money than I do. If they're buying ETFs, I'm buying e Japanese ETFs. Come on, no, there's now there's a, whenever there's a problem, people look for a, a theory. Uh, Mr. Marx had a great theory, and a lot of people tried it for a long time. Uh, nobody wants to be a Marxist anymore, but it was wonderful theory. Now there's one called MMT. More money today. Everybody loves it. It's a fabulous theory, and we'll probably try something like that. You know, like Marxism was a free lunch for everybody. Well, it didn't work. And MMT, whatever the real name is, more money today. Basically, it's more money today. It's an easy way. And Jeff, people love easy answers. <laughs> yeah, no, the the U.S. government has made it legal for the central bank, the Federal Reserve, to buy other assets. And when things get really bad, they're going to do everything they can. To save themselves, they don't care about you or your kids or my kids. They care about the next election, and the way they do that is, if they have to, is they flood the money. They're all going to buy IBM or Ford or whatever they're going to buy. I mean, to me, it's just a simple fact. I look around the world. I know that in 2008 we had a horrible problem in the world because of too much debt. Well. I mean, I read the same newspapers you do. I know that since 2008, debt all over the world has skyrocketed. So I say to myself, well, the next time we have a problem, it's got to be the worst in my lifetime because the debt is so so much worse than 2008. To me, that's just a simple statement,、yeah. simple observation. Like you know, we're going to have bad blizzards every few years. Well, you have bad blizzards. If I tell you we're going to have horrible blizzards every few years. Is that a grandiose statement? Look at what happened in Texas. You know it happens. And when I say the next bear market is going to be the worst in my lifetime, I know what happened in 2008. I know what's happened since. How can it not be? To me, that's just a simple observation.